the last chapter of the best Christmas pageant ever. Let's find out what those Herdmans do. On the night of the pageant, we didn't have any supper because mother forgot to fix it. My father said that was all right. Between Mrs. Armstrong's telephone calls and the pageant rehearsals, he didn't expect supper anymore. When it's all over, he said, we'll go someplace and have hamburgers. But mother said when it was all over, she might want to go someplace and hide. We've never once gone through the whole thing, she said. I don't know what's going to happen. It may be the first Christmas pageant in history where Joseph and the wise men get in a fight and Mary runs away with the baby. <laughs> she might be right, I thought. And I wondered what all the rest of us in the angel choir ought to do in case that happened. It'd be dumb for us just to stand there singing about the holy infant if Mary had run off with him. <laughs> but nothing seemed very different at first. There was the usual mess all over the place. Baby angels getting poked in the eye by other baby angels' wings. Grumpy shepherds stumbling over their bathrobes. The spotlight swooped back and forth and up and down until it made you sick at your stomach to look at it. And, as usual, whoever was playing the piano pitched away in a manger so high we could hardly hear it, let alone sing it. My father says, away in a manger always starts out sounding like a closet full of mice. But everything settled down, and at 7.30, the pageant began. While we sang away in a manger, the ushers lit candles all around the church, and the spotlight came on to be the star. So you really had to know the words to away in a manger, because you couldn't see anything, not even Alice Wendelkin's Vaseline eyelid. At first, we sang two verses of A Little Town of Bethlehem, and then we were supposed to hum some more of A Little Town of Bethlehem when Mary and Joseph came in from a side door. Only, they didn't come in right away. So we hummed and hummed and hummed, which is boring and also very hard. And before long, it doesn't sound like a song anymore. It just sounds like an old refrigerator. I knew something like this would happen, Alice Wendelkin whispered to me. They didn't come at all. We won't have any Mary and Joseph. And now what are we supposed to do? I guess we could have gone on humming till we all turned blue, but we didn't have to. Ralph and Emmeline were there all right. Only for once, they didn't come through the door pushing and shoving each other out of the way. They just stood there for a minute, as if they weren't sure they were in the right place. Because of the candles, I guess, and the church being full of people. They looked like the people you see on the six o'clock news. Refugees sent to wait in some strange, ugly place with all their boxes and sacks around them. Suddenly it occurred to me that this was just the way it must have been for the real Holy Family stuck away in a barn by people who didn't much care what happened to them. They couldn't have been very neat and tidy either. Or more like this, Mary and Joseph. Imogene's veil was crooked as usual, and Ralph's hair stuck out all around his ears. Imogene had the baby doll, but she wasn't carrying it the way she was supposed to, cradled in her arms. She had it slung over her shoulder, and before she put it in the manger, she thumped it twice on the back. I heard Alice gasp and she poked me. I don't think it's very nice to burp the baby Jesus, she whispered, as if he had colic. Mm. Colic is when babies get really upset stomachs and they're kind of gassy. And so when a baby has colic, you have to like walk with them a lot and burp them and mm. they're very uncomfortable. Oh. <laughs> then she poked me again. Do you suppose he could have had colic? I said, I don't know why not. And I didn't. He could have had colic or been fussy or hungry just like any other baby. After all, the whole point of Jesus was that he didn't come down on a cloud like something out of Amazing Comics, but that he was born and lived, a real person. Right away we had to sing, well, shepherds watch their flock by night. And we had to sing very loud because there were more shepherds than there were anybody else. And they made so much noise banging their crooks around like a bunch of hockey sticks. The shepherds' crooks are big wooden poles. So imagine a bunch of little kids in bathrobes banging on the big wooden poles. Mm -hmm. Next came Gladys from behind the angel choir, pushing people out of the way and stepping on everyone's feet. Since Gladys was the only person in the pageant who had anything to say, she made the most of it. Hey, unto you a child is born, she shouted. Adam, stop too. She hollered as if the, it was for sure the best news in the world. All the shepherds trembled, sore afraid of, of Gladys, mainly. But it looked good anyway. Then came three carols about angels. It took that long to get the angels in because they were all primary kids, 
and they got nervous and cried and forgot where they were supposed to go and bent their wings in the door and things like that. We got a little rest then, while the boys sang We Three Kings of Orion are, and everybody in the audience shifted around to watch the wise men march up the aisle. What have they got? Alice whispered. I didn't know, but whatever it was, it was heavy. Leroy almost dropped it. He didn't have his frankincense jar either, and Claude and Ollie didn't have anything, although they were supposed to be bringing the golden myrrh. I knew this would happen, Alice said for the second time. I bet it's something awful. Like what? Like a burnt offering. You know those herdmans. Well, they did burn things, but they hadn't burned this yet. It was a ham, and right away I knew where it came from. My father was on the church charitable works committee. They gave away food baskets at Christmas, and this was the herdman's food basket ham, who is their Christmas dinner. It had a ribbon, it still had the ribbon tied around it saying Merry Christmas. I'll bet they stole that, Alice said. They did not. It came from their food basket. And if they want to give away their own ham, I guess they can do it. But even if the Herdmans didn't like ham, that was Alice's next idea. They had never before in their lives given away anything except lumps on the head. So you had to be impressed. Leroy dropped the ham in front of the manger. It looked funny to see a ham there instead of the fancy bath salts we always use for myrrh and frankincense. And then they went and sat down in the only space that was left. While we sang what child is this, the wise men were supposed to confer, that means talk, among themselves and then leave by a different door. So everyone would understand that they were going home one way or another. Or, I'm sorry, going home another way. But the herdmans forgot or didn't want to or something because they didn't confer and they didn't leave either. They just sat there and there wasn't anything anybody could do about it. They're ruining the whole thing, Alice whispered. But they weren't at all. As a matter of fact, it made perfect sense for the wise men to sit and rest, and I said so. They're supposed to have come a long way. You wouldn't expect them to just show up, hand over the ham, and leave. As for the ruining the whole thing, it seemed to me that the herdmans had improved the pageant a lot, just by doing what came naturally, like birds being the baby, for instance, or thinking a ham would make a better present than perfumed oil. Usually by the time we got to Silent Night, which was always the last carol, I was fed up with the whole thing and couldn't wait for it to be over. But I didn't feel that way this time. I almost wished for the pageant to go on with the herdmans in charge to see what else they would do that was different. Maybe the wise men would tell Mary about their problems with Herod, and she would tell them to go back and lie their heads off. Or Joseph would go with them and get rid of Herod once and for all. Or Joseph and Mary might ask the wise men to take the Christ child with them, figuring that nobody would look there. I was so busy planning new ways to save the baby Jesus that I missed the beginning of Silent Night. But it was all right, because everyone sings Silent Night, including the audience. We sang all the verses, too. And when we got to Son of God Loves Cheer Light, I happened to look at Imogene, and I almost dropped my hymn book on a baby angel. Everyone had been waiting all this time for the Hermans to do something absolutely unexpected. And sure enough, that's what happened. Imogene Herdman was crying. In the candlelight, her face was all shiny with tears, and she didn't even bother to wipe them away. She just sat there, awful old Imogene in her perky veil, crying and crying and crying. Well, it was the best Christmas pageant we'd ever had. Everybody said so, but nobody seemed to know why. When it was over, people stood around the lobby of the church talking about what was different this year. There was something special, everyone said, but they couldn't put their finger on what. Mrs. Wendelkin said, well, Mary, had, the mother of Jesus, had a black eye. That was something special, but only what you might expect, she added. She meant it was the most natural thing in the world for a herdman to have a black eye. But actually, nobody hit Imogene, and she didn't hit anybody else. Her eye wasn't really black either, just all puffy and swollen. She had walked into the corner of the choir row cabinet in kind of a daze, as if she had just caught on to the idea of God and the wonder of Christmas. And this was the funny thing about it all. For years I thought about the wonder of Christmas and the mystery of Jesus' birth, and never really understood it. But now, because of the Herdmans, it didn't seem so mysterious after all. When Imogene had asked me about what the pageant was about, I told her it was about Jesus. But that was just part of it. It was about a new baby and his mother and father who were in a lot of trouble. No money, no place to go, no doctor, nobody they knew. And then arriving from the east, like my uncle from New Jersey, some rich friend. But Imogene, I guess, didn't see it that way. Christmas just came over her all at once, like a case of chills and fever. And so she was crying and walking to the furniture. 
Afterward, there were candy canes and little tiny test strips for everyone and a poinsettia plant for my mother from the whole Sunday school. We put the costumes away, pulled up the collapsible manger, and just before we left, my father snuffed out the last of the tall white candles. I guess that's everything, he said, and we stood at the back of the church. All over now, it was quite the pageant. Then he looked at my mother. What's that you've got? It's the ham, she said. They wouldn't take it back, and they wouldn't take any candy either or any of the little Bibles. But Imogene did ask me for a set of the Bible story pictures, and she took out the Mary picture and said it was exactly right, whatever that means. I think it meant that no matter how she herself was, Imogene liked the idea of Mary in the picture, all pink and white and pure looking, as if she never washed the dishes or cooked supper or did anything else except have Jesus on Christmas Eve. But as far as I'm concerned, Mary is always going to look a lot like Imogene Herdman, sort of nervous and bewildered, but ready to clobber anyone who laid a hand on her baby. And the wise men are always going to be Leroy and his brothers bearing ham. Bearing means bringing. When we got out of the church that night, it was cold and clear with crunchy snow underfoot and bright, bright stars overhead. And I thought about the angel of the Lord, Gladys, with her skinny legs and her dirty sneakers sticking out from under her robe, yelling at all of us everywhere, Hey, unto you a child is born. That is the Herdman's. You may take the AR on this. That's Little, the end. That's the end. A few bonus, point, few bonus AR points for your Christmas gift. Dante, cut.